Hello and welcome to this evening's event brought to you by the Zoological Society of London. My name is Charlotte and I will be your host for tonight as we discuss biobanking for conservation. We've got four fantastic speakers lined up for you tonight and we really welcome your questions as well. So in order to share a question with us, um, we've got a couple of options for how you can do this. So I'm just going to share my screen with you one more time and change my slides there we go so um the way that we'd prefer you to ask your questions because hopefully it's the, the simplest is by going to www.pigeonhole.at forward slash one nine three one that's www.pigeonhole.at forward slash one nine three one and there you'll be able to post your question and you'll also be able to see questions that other people have asked already so uh, if someone's asked a question that you're also interested in hearing the answer to you can upvote it uh, and that means that we'll be able to focus on sort of the most popular questions first the ones that you really want to know the answer to so please do go to pigeonhole and share your questions with us uh, however if you have any problems accessing that website then you can also email your questions to us uh, by sending them to scientific.events at zsl.org that's scientific.events at zsl.org and we'll be able to throw those questions into the mix for you too at the end of the event, I'll be sharing another link with you, uh, which is to a SurveyMonkey feedback form, because we would really like to know what you thought of tonight's event. So please do go to surveymonkey.com forward slash r forward slash ZSL event nine to let us know what you thought. But I will share that link with you again at the end of the event. So as I mentioned, we have got four fantastic speakers for you tonight from across the world, several of them from here in the UK, but one who is joining us all the way from Hawaii. But first up tonight, we're going to be joined by Paul Pierce Kelly from the Zoological Society of London. Paul is ZSL's Senior Curator of Invertebrates and Fish and has over 30 years of experience developing and managing species conservation breeding and reintroduction programmes. His research focuses on the evaluation of climate change impacts on species and ecosystems. A trustee of the Frozen Ark Cryopreservation Initiative, Paul is an advocate for the conservation potential of cryopreservation to help address the biodiversity crisis facing humanity. Paul is going to open up this evening's presentations by discussing why biodiversity conservation needs cryopreservation. Paul, over to you. Thank you very much. And let's see if I'm clever enough to get the exhibit, the presentation up. Can you see that? Are we okay? Yes, perfect. Marvellous. Right. Well, thank you very much. So we're very fortunate. We have wonderful colleagues on this scientific meeting who can give you the real detail for just what cryopreservation or biobanking, as it's often called as well, can actually do. My job to start this uh, session off is to give an overview of why we desperately need it from the biodiversity, from the biodiversity crisis perspective. And uh, it's looking at the traditional way we would have a species conservation program right the way through to how you would develop that as a kind of a, a arc type approach, how biobanking comes in or cryopreservation and the reality of what we're really looking at in terms of the biodiversity crisis. So just to start off with uh, a, a good old fashioned species program, these are the famous part, uh, Partula snails from French Polynesia, very, uh, very well known in conservation circles, but from research as well. And it's a classic case of how a species gets noticed uh, it has a lot of attention. If there's a problem, people will spot and see what's happening, a whole range of different species from the, uh, from the region they come from. And when they get into trouble, uh, then there's a conservation response. And here we have an international breeding program, all kinds of efforts to keep them going for many, many years, and also part of a reintroduction program. Now, uh, partially are also uh, big focal studies for some of the uh, researchers who helped to set up some cryopreservation initiatives like the frozen arc. So uh, Professor Brian Clark and uh, colleagues were uh, there at the beginning and partialers were in the start of that. But even then, within the context of an international program, 
some actual species do really well, some do not do well at all, and in fact end up being lost from the program. And because we, and I should say me as the coordinator, didn't make sure 20 years ago that those populations of those species went in to prior preservation, they were lost, not just from the program, but from the world as well. So it just makes the point that even with a traditional, everyone looking at those species needs, we can miss the boat sometimes, it just makes the important um, consideration. Also, within French Polynesia, there was a big workshop just a uh, year or two ago, where we were looking at the wider region across the Pacific region. It's not just, you know, a handful of species, there are many thousands of species of uh, uh, endemic land snails, so something around 6,000 across the Pacific region, and only a handful of those are really getting conservation attention. So again, it's making the point that a few lucky species will find their way into really rolled up sleeves, lots of attention, but otherwise they will probably struggle to get any kind of help. And again, it really highlights the need at the very least, we should be making sure that populations of those species, while they're still available, are preserved in cryopreserved uh, conditions so that they have a chance in, in the actual future should the worst happen, which in, invariably it actually will. Another example are corals which everyone probably knows is one of the most fragile species in terms of uh, current um, biodiversity threats. And again, the wonderful red listing process to highlight threatened species that are being looked at again. So we're looking at the uh, threat status of corals, hopefully capturing all the uh, considerations that we need to with knowledge of uh, the latest science. This is a big biodiversity profile initiative that, um, that was done very recently and made the uh, conclusions just how incredibly vulnerable corals were. Uh, uh, even if we stick to the Paris Agreement, you have a, a tremendous amount of loss and at two degrees, you almost lose everything. New information coming along with ocean deoxygenization, uh, really major impact on marine systems. Uh, for, um, uh, annual bleaching events coming upon us very shortly in terms of uh, looking out to very few numbers of years ahead. So all of these things have to be taken into account. Ocean acidification, a major impact on the marine systems, literally changing the chemistry of the ocean, which these things can actually survive and thrive. And this is just to make the point, it's not just the 800 plus species of reef forming corals, it's the conservatively estimated 800,000 plus species, which are reliant on those coral reefs, which are all bound up together. And if we're lucky, the corals may get a focus, but will those other species, the vast majority won't. So again, if they're not going to be the subject of really concerted conservation focus, they at the very least need to be prioritized for going into cryo, uh, cryo banks, uh, which is, I think, currently something which is really at the very beginning of that. And the urgency is really increasingly being highlighted. When you're dealing with the invertebrates, of course, there's a big taxonomic knowledge gap. So we actually have an estimate of how many species there may be, a rather conservative one, perhaps, but that's the working estimate. A lot of those uh, invertebrates which are yet to be actually uh, even identified yet. So it just goes to show we know a lot about certain groups, but for a lot of the invertebrates, there's still a lot of knowledge. But we still nevertheless know what's happening to them in a broad sense and a real biodiversity crisis again across pollinating species and all kinds of um, um, uh, groups that you could um, uh, highlight. And again, in the bigger context of environmental change, you have the uh, big uh, IPCC uh, review showing what's happening in the oceans and the cryosphere systems and how that's affecting these incredibly important ecosystems. And you can see just how we're already going into the really danger zone in terms of the uh, uh, threat that those systems are facing. Uh, again, the 1.5 uh, report people have heard an awful lot about that really highlights again just how vulnerable these actual systems are across a wide, uh, very wide range of ecosystems. Uh, and these assessments themselves struggle to bring in tipping points and um, cascading uh, uh, events uh, from those tipping points. So again, we may be looking at a much uh, more sensitive system still, even that the even though it's worrying um, enough with the findings which are coming out. So very significant papers like uh, the one looking at the uh, trajectories in the Earth system by Stefan et al. really high would recommend people looking at to really see how those sensitivities are really coming, coming, coming to the fore. Uh, and that's partly why when we're looking at um, assessments of biodiversity threat, the numbers are really beginning to 
be sky high. So the most recent uh, biodiversity review highlighted that there were concerns that a million species were looking at uh, um, a real tangible um, risk of becoming lost. And again, there are new reports coming out, further refining those uh, concerns all the time. So it's not for want of lack of information. This is just to show that the red list, which is again, one of the key tools the world uses to assess how the world is doing in terms of its biodiversity, will always, you know, tries to catch up with things, but it has something like 37,000 species threatened with becoming lost. Uh, and there you've got uh, from a total review of 134,000 uh, species, which is great. But when you consider a million species have been assessed to be at uh, risk, it shows you that there's a lot of catching up to do and it's always that struggle. And this is to show the reality check we always need to make. Where are we actually on in terms of climate uh, trajectories and we are at the end of these worst case scenario spectrums which is the real concern we have to always keep in mind to end on a positive note i would highlight coming from the zoo community myself just how significant we can make the zoo uh, world in terms of the zoos and aquariums the vast range of species which they have and so we can add to those uh, cryo cryo banks uh, the sheer number of species and the actual populations that we can do uh, both in Europe uh, focus, but in global as well, very, very significant. And even now facility to track and to bank those species and put them onto the global record system. So there's really no excuse for not engaging. And just to conclude, I'd really make the point prior, prior, that prior preservation really needs to become an integral component of pretty much any species conservation action. We need to recognize the escalating climate threat is really uh, showing that the majority of our planet's biodiversity is now a really high uh, concern. And it's not just the formerly threatened species that we have to prioritize. We should be making a, a real need to scale up our uh, actual efforts to make sure that as many species as possible find themselves into biobanks. And that needs really robust engagement with prior preservation expertise, facilities and biobanking initiatives and to support those initiatives to expand as much as we possibly can. So I think that that's my flyover, hopefully giving colleagues an idea of uh, why we really need this because the biodiversity, the biodiversity crisis could not be more pressing uh, and indeed urgent. And just to end off, thank you some colleagues within the cryopreservation world who have been very helpful in terms of uh, ongoing discussions. And it's very fortunate we have such a good community. So there's a real strong, wonderful set of expertise that we can benefit from us kind of conservation, normal working people. There's no excuse for us not to actually collaborate. So I hope that helps to actually get the proceedings and the discussions underway. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Paul. That was a really interesting um, overview and a great way to, to kick off the event. Um, we have got some questions coming through on Pigeonhole, which is fantastic, but I'm going to share my screen uh, with you all one more time, just to remind you of the address. Um, so please do go to www.pigeonhole.at forward slash 1931. That's pigeonhole.at forward slash 1931 to share your questions for any of this evening's speakers. Um, if there's someone in particular you, you'd like to answer your question, then just make sure you make a note of their name so I know um, who to direct it to. Uh, but if you'd like to ask them, them all uh, the same question, you can also mention that and we will do our best. But please do share your questions. And as I mentioned before, you can also upvote other people's questions too. Um, so we can try and uh, prioritize which ones we answer that way. Um, so Paul, I said we'd got a couple of questions coming through. And um, the first one we've received, I'm not sure if if possibly the, the other speakers might also um, have a comment on this one. So I'm, I may bring it back into to the mix later on. But uh, are you aware of any breakthroughs yourself in human medicine in recent years that could help in the field of, of cryopreservation and vice versa? Is that something you can comment on or shall I ask everyone else later? I think that's a good question for some much better qualified colleagues to answer. Okay, we'll, we'll bring that one back then uh, later on because we'll... Um, 
try and take a few questions after each presentation this evening, but we will then have a more general yeah. Q&A at the end of the event. So we will definitely um, refer back to that one. Um, another question that we've had through Paul is what are the practical applications for biobank collections? Uh, it seems useful for documenting species, but what is the potential conservation impact? I think we are going to be hearing probably more about this later on, um, but is there anything you'd like to add at this point? Well, that's why I'm such an ardent proponent of uh, cryo preservation because it's not just putting it into long term secure suspended state that you can go back in many years from now although that could well be absolutely critical it's a practical way to maximize the conservation uh, results you can get from current species uh, work and that may be helping to generate more resilient strains to cope with wider environmental pressures it could bring back lost genetic vigor into populations which have lost that over time there's a myriad of things and they will come out from the following talks Definitely. so we should have a lot of detail on that Yes, absolutely. Um, well, Paul, while I have you here, you mentioned zoos and aquariums and the role that they can potentially play in all of this. And obviously, being based within a large zoological organisation yourself, what, what, what are the main challenges that, that collections face in, in terms of becoming more involved in uh, cryopreservation and um, sort of being able to add material to, to these collections? Yeah, well, it, it's a combination of firstly awareness. Uh, again, it's, we've been very fortunate that people have been working for many years to hone skills and create opportunities for us to engage. Now that's there, we need to just be more aware of that, the wider conservation community, and know that the precious populations we are working with if they can be incorporated into these uh, uh, cryo, cryo banks, then we're absolutely mad not to be able to do it. And the, we can do it now physically because the initiatives are there, including the EASA Biobank Initiative uh, and uh, several other initiatives, which together cover the world. Uh, there's never enough resource, but there's nothing to stop us actually engaging at this point. So, uh, and again, helping to improve and increase that capacity. Brilliant. And, and you mentioned how important it is to be able to sort of scale that up as, as well. How do you see that, that happening in, in the future? Well, um, I would urge that it's taking advantage of the knowledge which is already there. If you can do it for one species of coral, you can do it for pretty much all the other species of coral or help to push that. And, about, and, and, and unless a, an actual species gets looked at and said, oh, can we, can we process that into the... Uh, uh, biobank it isn't going to get the attention and perhaps the nuance of uh, technical tweaks that is needed to make sure that it can have a secure uh, home there so if we don't bring these species into play then they may just always struggle to be adequately represented but often now we're fortunate that skill sets are actually really there to take us more than halfway Brilliant. Well, thank you so much, Paul. We will bring you back uh, later on to join the Q&A at the end of the event. But for now, we're going to hear from our next speaker, who is Professor William Holt. Bill is currently a visiting professor at the University of Sheffield and an honorary research associate of the Smithsonian Institution in Washington, DC. Bill spent much of his professional life at the Zoological Society of London until retiring in 2011. In his research, Bill has combined studies of basic reproductive biology in various species, including many wild species, with some practical developments of reproductive technologies and their applications to wildlife conservation. Bill is going to be discussing biobanking for breeding threatened species. Bill, thank you so much for joining us this evening. Okay, thank you. I'll try and share my screen this time then. <clears throat> Well, I'd like to begin by thanking the organisers for inviting me to speak, actually. Um, and I'm going to be focusing on the practical use of biobanks, as in one of the questions. So my talk is really about biobanking for breeding threatened species. And just to give you a little bit of background on that. <clears throat> so the objectives uh, of biobanking in this context are 
that we can collect uh, living sperm, oocytes, embryos, somatic cells, stem cells. And in the context of um, advancing technologies, actually, we can use those uh, as well. Um, it's important to say that we need to keep these samples um, in a disease-free environment um, and also maintain them so that they don't uh, disintegrate or, or, or become damaged over time because potentially they could be stored for a hundred years or possibly more. And the object of doing this is to help to support animal breeding especially in small populations and especially for maximizing genetic diversity. <clears throat> so we can conceptualize this idea a bit um, by, I've put basically a, a Noah's Ark picture at the top here, um, but you shouldn't think of we're going to keep everything in one place, that isn't very practical, but nevertheless, we can store sperm embryos, oocytes, etc., and and then hopefully use them at some point. As I said, now we can use those in collaboration with ex situ conservation programs, where there's veterinary support. The animals are in captive populations, whether that's in zoos, managed wildlife parks, and so forth. So that is actually reasonably practical at the moment. And there are a number of examples of that. Um, but on the other hand, we can envisage using those with in situ conservation programs, especially where we have fragmented populations of wild species. And also, especially if those fragmented populations have become isolated from each other. And we can envisage applying our technologies, artificial insemination, in vitro fertilization, and so forth, we can apply those technologies to link um, populations together, even within a country, if you've got several populations which really can't interact with each other. Um, and in that sense, we can envisage the biobank as a kind of equivalent to a wildlife corridor that people with an ecology background will recognize immediately. <clears throat> I've just got a couple of examples that show the value when a project like this is undertaken. And the example I'm going to talk about is the black-footed ferret. Um, it's a US species. It was considered extinct until 1981. A uh, remnant population of 18 animals was discovered in Wyoming and taken into captivity. It, these were actually diseased animals, and so there was little hope for them to recover if left alone. To their credit, um, the Smithsonian Institution, together with the US Fish and Wildlife Service and other organizations, decided to set up a breeding program and they included biobanking. So they collected sperm, they used artificial insemination. And in fact, the frozen sperm that they collected back in the late 1980s is still available for use. And that has been extremely successful. Um, the technique for doing artificial insemination is not simple in a species like a ferret. It is highly skilled. And so they had to use, rely on uh, domestic ferrets as a sort of guide to begin their process of research. So it's, it's not simple. But having said that, um, more than 8,000 animals have been bred in captivity, whether by artificial insemination or by natural breeding under the captive breeding program. And a thousand of those have actually been reintroduced to the original location. So this is a real success story. And um, it's one that is often reported on as being a great success for biobanking. I'll just go back. Um, the availability of the sperm from the founder population has actually been shown by genetic techniques uh, to have made an enormous contribution to 
preventing the complete loss of um, diversity and uh, mitigating the effects of inbreeding. So there was a paper that was published in 2016. I don't have time to go into that, but it's actually a very nice demonstration about the advantage of having that bank of frozen sperm available. The other aspect that I wanted to mention um, was that people are taking an interest in uh, the applications of technology and biobanking in relation to amphibian um, extinction crisis. People will know probably that there is a global extinction crisis for amphibians which are suffering from a fungal disease and also from various viral diseases and um, this is happening uh, all over the world including the UK, Australia, the US and so forth. And uh, over the last, I suppose, 20 years, there's been a lot of interest in whether we can do anything using technology for amphibians. And it turns out that you can. And just as a simple example here, um, if we have a male and female representing in this photograph, we can inject them with a hormone which targets the function of the testis in the male and the ovary in the female and that stimulates the females to actually um, release eggs directly into water they can be collected like this into a petri dish and at the same time with the males it's possible to stimulate the release of sperm interestingly in amphibians there's a quirk of nature where sperm are produced together with urine because of the physiology of these amphibians. And you might think the urine would kill the sperm, but that's not actually the case. Let me go back. <clears throat> so all we have to do when we've got the sperm and the eggs is to mix them together in water without any complicated media. Fertilization takes place and tadpoles are produced. Uh, projects in Australia and in the USA especially um, have resulted in the release of uh, in vitro fertilization produced tadpoles into the wild and I put here a reference to a, a 2019 paper which or review which says that hundreds of thousands of IVF tadpoles have been released into the wild. Of course we don't know the survival um, even if they were naturally produced, that might not be that great. Uh, I've just put a few examples of um, some amphibians that have been researched and, and where successful fertilization has taken place. Um, you see three US species, an Australian species, a Puerto Rican crested toad here. And um, I know about this a little bit because I was involved as a co-supervisor in one of the projects. <clears throat> now, as technology advances, there are new possibilities and I only just have time to just mention what those are. If we have cell lines, which can be collected and produced from cultured tissues, um, people are interested in cloning. Cloning is part of agricultural practice these days. And some animals have been cloned already. It, uh, it's possible from these cultured cell lines to generate embryos and use embryo transfer to produce uh, so that females become pregnant. Um, it's also possible to induce the production of stem cells. And that even allows the generation de novo of sperm and oocytes in culture. And some people are even more ambitious and envisage that they can reconstruct and edit genomes from ancient DNA. People particularly are interested in the woolly mammoth, for example, and think that they'll one day be able to generate woolly mammoths. Um, this, these new developments, I would say, are set to revolutionize some aspects of uh, animal biotechnology. But I also want to mention that they, at the same time, pose many difficult ethical conundrums. 
And without having a great deal of time to go through these, um, one is, will these technologies, especially cloning, produce genetic uniformity instead of diversity? Another is, will the offspring suffer from epigenetic effects? That is uh, um, an effect where gene expression or the way that genes are expressed is slightly changed. And that's associated with lab procedures and can lead to some um, diseases in even in humans. And will they facilitate de-extinction? So there is actually a lot of um, enthusiasm among some conservation biologists for bringing back extinct species. Some of these technologies will allow that to happen. The ethical question here is, is that a good or a bad thing? So I'll stop there and um, I hope I've left you with some questions which don't have any easy answers. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Bill. Well, it's definitely prompted some questions from our, our viewers, which is fantastic. So I'm going to run through a few of them now and then we will take more later on as well. Um, one of the questions though that has come through uh, is related to the black-footed uh, ferrets that you mentioned. Um, and they ask if the small number of founders in the population mean that there is a lack of genetic diversity and is that a problem for future generations of the species? Um, well, yes, you would pr probably predict that that isn't the ideal scenario. Uh, but the fact that there have been 8,000 animals reintroduced um, seems to imply that the black-footed ferret can actually survive reasonably well. Um, I mean, it's a possibility that if they were suddenly struck down by another disease that swept through, then they wouldn't have much protection because that's the reason why genetic diversity exists. So it's a possibility, yes. But they're doing okay at the moment. Uh, yes, I think so. Brilliant. And um, there's also another question, and I'm not sure if it's referring to um, one of the examples in, in particular or just generally, but um, the, the viewer asks, how successful is artificial fertilization? Um, it, I don't know if it perhaps uh, varies between, between species and, and different cases. It is tremendously variable depending on which species you're talking about. So artificial insemination, you know, classically, the whole of the dairy industry depends on it and uh, nearly all cattle across the world are born using artificial insemination and these days embryo transfer. But if you were talking to somebody whose interest is in leopards or species like that, then those techniques are much call for a much um, different protocol and are less successful. And this is because of species differences. Um, as one of my former colleagues said, uh, a cow is not the same as a cheetah. It's a very strong lesson to take, yes. Thank you, Bill. Um, and one more question for, for now before we move on. Are there any ethical issues around cloning that you have to deal with? Um, and I, I would imagine there are probably, <laughs> probably lots. <laughs> there are a lot of ethical issues. And yeah, we could talk for hours on this. Uh, cloning is taking place in domestic animals such as cattle, uh, cattle, pigs, etc. We know that that results in a high level of early life mortality. Um, we also know it's very intensive. Uh, it's not hugely successful, um, but there are some examples and um, th it's possible that there are individual cases which have been successful, but at the moment, it's not a reliable technique that you would sort of bet on, I don't think. But yeah, ethical issues really come into this. I bet. Um, well, thank you very much, Bill. We will bring you back later on because there are plenty more um, questions for us all to discuss. But for now, we're going to move on to this evening's next speaker, who is Kirsty Lloyd. Kirsty is the CryoArcs technician based at the Natural History Museum in London. She curates the collections of zoological genetic material housed in the Molecular Collections Facility at the museum. 
facilitating increased access to samples by the research community. She also provides training and support to other institutions looking to improve collections care and management. She has a background in molecular ecology, science education, and is actively involved in the natural sciences collections community in the UK. Kirsty is going to uh, be giving us some insight into the UK animal biobanking landscape to support research and conservation. Kirsty, over to you. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Charlotte. And uh, hello, everyone. Um, as Charlotte said, I'm a technician working with the Cryox Initiative based at the Natural History Museum in London. Um, it's a privileged talk at this event this evening. And during this talk, I'm going to tell you about the UK biobanking landscape that supports conservation and research and how biobanking works and how to contribute. So previous talks have described how samples held in frozen collections are extremely valuable. The information they contain can inform how we protect and conserve the biodiversity on our planet in the face of anthropogenic threats. Um, the butterflies on this map represent repositories, all of which are members of the Global Genome Biodiversity Network. There are institutions across the world that support the collections and um, storage of animal and plant material. So within the biobanking community, um, organisations are contributing to the global effort in different ways. Um, museums have been storing samples and specimens in collections for many, many years and often supply samples for research, although not all are cryogenically preserved. Now dedicated cryo facilities exist, like the, the National Biodiversity Cryobank of Canada and the well-known frozen zoo at San Diego Zoo's Institute of Conservation and Research. These are large facilities, but there are other smaller institutions that hold frozen collections. Um, some are generalist in nature and some are more taxon specific. Um, there are also charitable organizations that are dedicated to animal biobanking. Based in the UK, but with partners across the world, the Frozen Ark delivers projects that support the preservation of genetic materials such as tissues and DNA samples of endangered species. They also actively raise awareness of conservation through education and outreach. Um, with a similar drive, um, Nature Safe is a relatively new charity dedicated to the long-term storage of live cells from animal species that are at the greatest risk of extinction. They work to preserve cells in a way that maintains viability, allowing them to be thawed and used to establish pregnancies and restore endangered animal species. Lastly, there are collaborative initiatives um, which exist um, to provide sector specific support. The European Marine Biological Resource Centre is a distributed research infrastructure with marine stations spread across multiple locations. Uh, the EMBRC provides researchers and companies with access to marine uh, organisms and the facilities to study them. Another key collaboration with a defined focus is the European Association of Zoos and Aquaria Biobank. Um, IASA have four established and dedicated biobanking facilities for the European and Middle Eastern zoo and aquarium communities. The IASA Biobank connects researchers to available tissue, blood and serum samples and supports population management research and conservation research. Um, CryoArts, on the other hand, is a UK based collaboration with a, a more generalised focus. So the Cryox uh, Initiative is a coordinated multidisciplinary UK zoological biobanking project for non-model species. It's a BBSRC funded initiative um, collaborating with Frozen Arc, as I mentioned before, and the UK hub of the IASA Biobank to link the many diverse and dispersed animal frozen collections found in freezers of research institutes, universities, museums, zoos and aquaria across the country. The Cryox hubs uh, where our physical collections are stored are based at the Molecular Collection Facility at the Natural History Museum in London, where I work, um, at the Biobank in National Museums of Scotland, and at the Royal Zoological Society of Scotland um, in Edinburgh. So dedicated cryo facilities um, like those at the Cryox hubs are purpose built and um, appropriately store and manage frozen samples. Um, I'd like to show you how they go about doing this. So the Cryox Hub in Edinburgh is based at the National Museum Collection Centre of NMS, National Museum of Scotland. It is a cold storage facility dedicated to archiving samples collected from zoo and wild animal um, specimens with the 
within the museum research collection. Um, the facility stores blood and tissue samples. You can see here my colleague Jill Murray Dixon preparing a, a tissue sample by dissecting it and placing it into a cryovial. Cryovials are specific, specifically designed tubes for long term storage at ultra low temperatures, and the cryoax hubs use barcoded cryovials for sample management. The cryovials are placed in barcoded boxes and stored in specific locations within an ultra low temperature freezer. The freezers and the room temperatures are regulated and monitored um, by alarm systems, which means some lucky person gets an alert, usually in the middle of the night, that one of the freezers has failed and they can act and protect samples by moving them to a backup freezer. So facilities like the one I just showed you use technologies to appropriately store and safeguard valuable samples. Um, but state-of-the-art sample storage also needs state-of-the-art data management. So uh, we, barcoding um, adds a completely unique identifier to the sample, which enables it to be tracked. Um, frozen tube compatible labels, uh, like the ones we use and the ones pictured here, can be added to tubes, or the samples are transferred to new cryovials with etched barcodes. Um, a lab or collections management system records the sample's location in the freezer, so we can find it, um, as well as all of its associated metadata. And it also can push the data to a discoverable and searchable data portal. So um, an appropriately stored and curated collection preserves an invaluable snapshot in time of existing biodiversity. The physical and informatic infrastructure is in place, as you've seen, to capture and preserve these snapshots. Resources and support are also available to facilitate the contribution of samples to biobanks. Existing sample collections can be transferred to a cryox hub under a material transfer agreement for long-term storage. Um, to start with, an inventory of the collection would be, would be needed. Um, there are, is guidance and resources for training a team to conduct an inventory um, and to reliably gather and manage inventory data, all available on the Cryox website under the resources page. Um, Cryox also supports data-only entries to the Cryox database. So this enables collections to be made discoverable under a data transfer agreement where the data is shared, but the storage and management of the physical samples is retained by the donating institution. This networked approach means um, samples donated to any Cryox partner or data shared by any member of the Cryox community will all be made discoverable through the Cryox initiative. Zoo and Aquaria samples um, are directed towards the Yaza Biobank, where the RZSS Wild Genes Biobank facility is the Yaza Biobank UK hub and is also a Cryox partner. Cryox have supported the development of resources for zoos and aquaria to biobank samples, including a resources pack with sampling protocols. It also has guidelines for temporarily storing samples locally before transferring them to the biobank, which has been particularly useful during COVID where access to facilities was restricted. Um, samples can be donated under the Yaza material transfer agreement and the option of a data only transfer to the Yaza biobank is, is still in progress. Um, EASA samples can be accessed either directly from EASA or by applications to the Cryox re request process, um, which I will go into in, in a minute. Um, in both cases, requests for EASA samples are approved by the EASA Biobank Working Group. So um, many larger collections, like at the Natural History Museum of London, have their own data portal. Um, where you can search for, through the uh, molecular collections facility samples within the NHM's data portal itself. Um, but the Cryox web-enabled uh, sample database links all of the dispersed collections taking part in Cryox across the country. This was developed using the Specify software and is being populated with data as we speak. Um, researchers can browse the public database to identify samples of interest held by all of the Cryox partners, um, like the lovely Phronema, which is in the bottom left-hand corner, which is located at the NHM. Um, samples held by um, multiple institutions can be applied for with a single Cryox um, re sample request form, which I think is a real benefit to, this, to the network system. And um, once the application is approved and approved and the loan agreement is in place, the samples are shipped via cold chain to the receiving institution to be used in their research or conservation project. So um, if you take nothing else from my talk, I hope that these three points will um, resonate with you all. Um, biological samples hold a wealth of knowledge as we've heard from previous talks, 
um, but they must be cared for appropriately to preserve the information and the potential that they contain. That's why um, biobanks are treasure troves of, of data that enable us to learn more about our planet while empowering us to safeguard its biodiversity both now and in the future. Um, so please take a look at the CryoArts website for more information or drop me a question. And um, thank you all very much for listening. Thank you so much, Kirsty. That was really uh, interesting. Um, and it, again, it's prompted lots of questions from our viewers as well. So I will jump straight into those. Um, one question that's come through is, are there any species, and I guess, you know, this would be sort of um, specimen samples that don't survive cryopreservation? Are you, are you aware of anything that's just re really hard to freeze? Yes, so there are uh, groups of species that tend to be more difficult than others, um, your marine invertebrates in particular, especially things that don't have a lot of structure to them. So um, it really is a, um, a, a group specific uh, thing and the research and development needs, there needs to be investment in it in order for us to, to understand these creatures more and to, and to best preserve them. So it's definitely an area of research that I'm hoping uh, that, that people watching might be interested in pursuing. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, and then also, uh, I've got a question specifically for you. Uh, what made you so passionate about this aspect of conservation? What was your journey to, to get into it? How did you get to where you are now? Um, I started off in molecular ecology. I was really interested in population genetics and, and um, how genetics can tell you so much about a population or a species and how we can use that information. Um, and I volunteered a lot in museums and found that I actually really, really enjoyed being in collections and managing collections. And again, it's, it's just all about that kind of font of knowledge that these collections are, uh, that these collections contain and what can be done with them. Um, and when I find myself um, yeah, marrying up both of those things, the molecular ecology, the genetic side of it, and collections work in the biobank. It's just, it's the place where I'm meant to be, I think. Um, and it marries up all my skills. And it, it means that I get to um, talk at events like this and um, we interact with researchers that are doing really, really interesting projects and hopefully help facilitate them to not only access samples to enable them to do those projects, but also to, uh, to biobank samples so that those samples can be preserved for future generations to, to do more with in the future, possibly long after um, that we, we've um, we finished working at the museum. Um, well, we have had a question through about the, the cost of biobanking sort of all, all species on Earth. I think I'm going to leave that for later on to see if anyone can uh, sort of have a, have a wild guess. But, uh, but we do also have a question asking, is it a struggle to financially keep these biobanks going? Because I, I imagine it's not cheap. Uh, no, no, it's not cheap. I think the setup costs are extremely expensive. But also these, these, the ultra low temperature freezers, the minus 80s and, and the liquid nitrogen tanks as well, they're, they're kind of energy guzzlers. They, they need a lot uh, of input and consistent input and they need a lot of service and maintenance. Um, and yeah, so the investment isn't just a, a a funding project to set yourself up but you also need that continual investment you need the staff time to be able to manage the collection so you know where everything is and that you can locate it when someone will need something or you can uh, invest time in, in reformatting it into new tubes to, to be able to curate it properly um, so it's, it's an ongoing cost and it can be quite difficult to to maintain that funding um, so I think if the more things like this, more biobanking and cryopreservation of samples is mainstream the more people are factoring it into their um, their project bids and or factoring it into their day-to-day -day routine if they're a veterinary um, uh, practice and they're, they're sampling routinely. So the more, the more that people are biobanking, the more these things will, will be funded and the funding will be maintained and, and everybody will see, see the benefit. Brilliant, thank you. Uh, one more question before we move on, um, which it asks, are collections duplicated in different sites to act act as a backup in, in case of, of incidents such as power cuts and, and so forth? Do, do you try and sort of spread, spread the specimens and, and duplicates out uh, across different, different sites? Yeah, and that's, a, that's an extremely important way of safeguarding a sample, actually. So, um, like I said, there is uh, temperature monitoring and alarm systems and people get texts in the middle of the night, usually on a weekend, if something goes wrong and they have to come in and deal with it and move things to backup freezers, if, if that capacity is there in that institution. Um, some institutions like the molecular collection facility at the NHM also have backup generators if the whole facility goes down. Um, but equally, you can't plan for everything and you wouldn't want everything, all your eggs in one basket, so to speak. You wouldn't want all your samples in one freezer and for them to go down and then for those, that, those valuable samples to be lost. So yes, partnering it up 
um, or being part of an initiative where you can have backup collections in, in corresponding institutions is a really important way of safeguarding your samples. Brilliant. Well, thank you so much, Kirsty. We will bring you back later on. Um, but now we're going to move on to our final speaker of the evening, who is Dr. Mary Hagedorn, who is joining us all the way from Hawaii, where it is pretty early in, in the morning. So thank you ever so much, Mary. Mary is a senior research scientist at the Smithsonian Conservation Biology Institute. She has worked in aquatic ecosystems around the world, from the Amazon to Africa, has taught many university level classes lectures frequencies, frequently to lay audiences, maintains an active laboratory with graduate students and postdocs, and is a successful researcher and active grant writer. Mary has created the field of coral cryopreservation and founded bio repositories around the world for coral species. Today, she is the director of the Reef Recovery Initiative, a global coral conservation program. And Mary is going to be discussing technological advances to help save coral reefs. For now, Mary, I have uh, a few quest questions, especially for you. Um, and one is that uh, during your presentation, you were talking about ice crystals um, forming and so someone who's watching would like to know why are ice crystals so detrimental in preservation and um, what what happens so it, a best way to think of it it's not exactly the same but you do this experiment at home all the time if you wrap a ham hamburger meat or I, you put your ice cream back and you, you don't cover it quite well. You get these massive ice crystals that form and it, it's called freezer burn and it makes the ice cream in the, or the hamburger not so delicious anymore. And um, so when ice crystals form within a cell, they can pierce the membrane and destroy the cell. So we really want to keep ice crystals out of the cells. It can be outside the cells, but we go to when things get really large, like organs or like an embryo, you really have to go to large extremes to warm them really rapidly at millions of degrees to keep them from having ice crystals within them. Fantastic. Thank you so much. And um, also too, uh, someone's picked up on this and, and I was going to ask you if nobody else did. You mentioned <laughs> that you can't preserve coral eggs. Why is that? And, and is it something that you think might be possible in the future? Um, it may be possible, um, but we're so restricted. We have coral eggs for about a, a year, maybe four or five hours, you know, and they're a single cell. So they're not like an embryo that has thousands of cells. So they're mechanically very delicate. Um, they're filled with lipids. Now, human embryos were, human sperm was cryopreserved in the 60s, human embryos in the 80s, but human eggs were not cryopreserved until well, until like 2000. And that's because they're filled with lipids. They're large. They have, they're just one cell. If you nick it, if you, you know, if you're transferring it, you nick that membrane, they fall apart. So they're very delicate. We have them for such a short period of time and they are going to be very difficult to cry preserve. So I've just gone for the greatest bang for my buck, you know, in terms of restoration and conservation and eggs were just not something I could, I, I had enough bandwidth to, to deal with. Fair, fair enough. And um, well, yeah. that relate, relates to another question that's been asked, um, which is what times of year are the, the two days of coral spawning um, that you mentioned? And can it be any time of year? And does it differ, differ between species? Absolutely. Um, the way to think of it is the endless summer. Across the globe, summer is somewhere on the globe and corals usually spawn in the summertime. And depending on the species, they may spawn um, in the United States, for example, we are in the middle of coral spawning and um, it's in some places it's August and some places it's July. It depends on the species. Um, on the Great Barrier Reef, it's November or December. Um, and, and the species will share time slots. Like if you have a, a massive spawn on the Great Barrier Reef and it's, it goes across a week, there'll be 400 species that are vying for that time slot in the evening um, to release their egg sperm bundles. And it's just the most amazing event, you can see the reproduction from space on the Great Barrier Reef. It's extraordinary. Wow, that sounds amazing. Um, and then an, another question for you, Mary, is are we on course to reach that goal in getting those 1000 species you mentioned? I hope so. <laughs> uh, it is, is it is definitely um, the, the the goal of, of our, our group. And, um, you know, we have a group on the Great Barrier Reef. We have uh, the World Coral Conservatoire in Europe. We have 
the Smithsonian, we have um, the, the Florida Coral Rescue and the AZA Coral Safe Program. Uh, many of these people have, I mean, we already have about, um, with, within the group, we already have about 60 or so species that are in captivity, um, and uh, we're just spinning up. So I, I think we will reach our goal of 1,000, and I'll say within 10 years. And I hope that is soon enough to be able to capture enough um, genetic diversity, because as everyone has mentioned, the, the biodiversity um, crisis is, is looming hard on coral reefs. And we see these vast step changes. It's not linear. It, you see these vast step changes. And a good example of that was the loss of one third of the Northern Great Barrier Reef in one bleaching event. Um, so, you know, I, I never cry preserved anything from the Northern Great Barrier Reef. And if I had, I could have re returned that diversity to those areas, but it's lost now. Thank you, Mary. And um, we're going to bring everybody back now because I think some of the, the remaining questions, everyone may well have something to, to contribute. Um, so let's see how many of those questions we can now get through. Um, we had one right at the start. Let's see if, yeah, I can bring it, bring it back. Um, that Paul suggested others may um, be able to comment on, um, which is, are there any breakthroughs in human medicine um, that could help in this field of cryopreservation and vice versa? So does anyone have anything to, to respond? on that okay, one very good. thank um, you just, just just from a collections management point of view so um human biobanks are quite extensive and they tend to be very, very very well funded and very specialized and they've been doing it for a long time and they know what they're doing um and they use um existing technologies where they um, manage the collections more digitally they, they know where the samples come in and out of the freezer because they've got the system to detect it that kind of thing um, and they're really really well established I think we can learn from that um, and learn from how they manage the data and how they use their collections management systems as well um, for, so just to put it into perspective the molecular collections facility is quite young it, it was established by my, my manager Jacqueline Kennedy Johnson in 2012 so um, the, the human biobanks tend to be a, a bit more well established and have been learning for a lot longer and there's definitely lessons that we can we can learn and take home that's great so you're not having to reinvent the wheel no absolutely and sharing ideas is so important and and there are networks that do that already and and i think that, it, that should just can continue and expand brilliant um, any other thoughts on that question I might, I might add to that charlotte as well um that uh some of the newer technologies that are coming online pe people are looking at organ cryopreservation it's vastly needed. And um, perhaps in the next five years, things like isochoric freezing and lasers will provide the answers for doing um, uh, organ cryopreservation. So I think you can look to some of the research that's done on wildlife um, that will help um, animals. I mean, that will help human, human, human uh, 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 preservation as well. Thank you. Can I butt in as well? Yeah. <laughs> Just one, one other thought is that um, surgical techniques developed for humans required um, some really sophisticated uh, laparoscopic tools, you know, the endoscopes and all that kind of thing. And they were established actually probably in the 70s and 80s. And people are using those with breeding some species where it's actually really difficult or very skillful needed to undertake artificial insemination, embryo transfer and that sort of thing in wild species. So um, those have been developed in human and that they're, they're used for wildlife. They've also been developed for agricultural use as well. So you get lessons from wherever you can. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you very much, everyone. Um, well. Kirsty, I'm going to come to you next because we've had a couple of questions um, asking about whether it's possible to, to volunteer uh, with the CryoArks project and um, because it looks like there's there's lots to be done. Um, and if it is possible to volunteer, how can, can people get involved and do they need sort of certain expertise? Um, yeah, so I, I did um, have a volunteer project running. Uh, that's before COVID hit. I had uh, um, volunteers working between um, the... Um, molecular collection facility in the natural history museum and at zsl and we're working together so where they were trained by me and um then worked in both collections and, and were extremely invaluable and then obviously COVID hit and the access was restricted and so we're hoping to get volunteers on site soon 
um, but that hasn't been um, kind of defined yet. Um, and I'm hoping that there'll be more opportunities as I will need more help. And I'm sure um, other collections will as well. Um, so I, I would just say just uh, keep an eye out on, on the website and on um, the partner websites as well for any opportunities that may come about, but I can't guarantee anything at the moment. No, no, tricky at the mm. moment, but hope, hopefully in the future it will be possible again. And, and as you mentioned, um, that, that information will be on our on our websites, probably on our Twitter channels too. So please do keep following those. And thank you, uh, Kirsty. Oh, and no, do you need any special expertise to be a, a volunteer or do you get all the, the training kind of with you, as it were? Yeah, so the, the specific training for, for, for biobanking itself um, would, would be facilitated, but um, the, the, a bit of background in either um, some kind of collections work in, in museums or um, uh, in, in laboratories as well and in, in handling samples as well is really, really valuable and um, just being comfortable in a lab environment as well. Um, so that kind of experience is, is, is really valuable and because it's all transferable skills that are, are really useful to, to collections management work. Thank you. Uh, well, I have another question, which is uh, proving really popular with our viewers, which is, are many zoological organisations currently engaged in biobanking? And what level of collaboration is there between nations and organisations in this area of conservation? Uh, would anyone like to respond to that one? Well, from my own experience, um, there is some collaboration going on. I work closely with the Smithsonian and I know that the Smithsonian works with other um, uh, other centres across the globe. I also <clears throat> have quite a lot of contacts with people in Australia who are very keen to biobank the Australian native fauna and uh, also New Zealand. So New Zealand is in the process of setting up a biobank for its own fauna as well at the moment. Um, we share expertise. Um, they, we often have joint meetings and uh, these days, even online, we can do that kind of thing. Mm. <clears throat> um, I, um, there are particular enthusiasts, I would say, who drive the field forward, but there are also people who are rather suspicious, so, um, which is inevitable, I suppose. But yeah, there is quite a, a lot of collaboration going on. Excellent. Thanks, Could Bill. I Perhaps could I also add that we're fortunate that the conservation community is much closer knit now than it ever used to be. So it's an expectation that there is collaboration at every at every level. So the it's called the kind of one plan approach for species conservation assistance. Whatever that species needs should be seen on the continuum of is it getting this support, that support, and absolutely part of that assessment should be and how is the cryo preservation needs for that species being met. And we have networks now which are international in terms of the zoo community uh, and, and indeed beyond. And they are there to be utilised and also how the information is shared, etc. So I think it, it, it all gels nicely with the philosophical approach that the way conservation has to work now and to, it has to be demonstrated to work. And everything you've heard uh, tonight I think are good examples of ju just the wealth of collaboration opportunities which is actually there and indeed being utilized as we speak. Mm, well I'll, I, I, yeah I, I, sorry I'd like to jump in here and just say um, you know I think in the in the coral community it's a it's a slightly different um, perspective and I and I think zoos and aquarium have for years seed banks it's very accepted that you cry preserve something and you work on a conservation plan etc cetera, etc cetera it's less accepted for wild spaces. And, and I think that, that that has slowed down our ability to conserve things because not only has there not been money for it, but there's been resistance, scientific resistance and lay resistance to having something cryopreserved. You know, they think of it as the last ditch effort. And if it's a last ditch effort for, for a community, you end up like the black-footed ferrets where you don't have a lot of genetic diversity and you're constantly struggling to keep those populations going. And that's not something we want for our wildlife. You know, we want to have a thoughtful conservation plan. So I think there is a, a division, you know, um, when you're talking about wild ecosystems versus zoos and managed programs. People accept it there. It's been acceptable for many, many years, but it's not that accepted really in wild spaces. 
And, and it is interesting, isn't it, that um, uh, 20 years ago, 25 years ago, you would have had the same response about, oh, conservation breeding, well, that's just giving up on the in-situ focus. Mm -hmm. And we hear the same thing now about, and it's, again, it's one endeavour. Species biodiversity needs absolutely every help it can possibly get. There is no luxury of, well, I will do this, but not that. It's whatever is needed. And if we don't have that holistic view we're not going to get through this real biodiversity crisis yeah, so I couldn't agree more Paul I think that's really well said yeah absolutely I'd agree as well and and just to say that obviously the initiatives out there the collaborations exist um and um to to go, pursue that holistic approach um do contact the the, the biobanking initiatives or, or um uh, the organizations that you feel would be able to support you and and to get the input right at the start right at the the application process right at the conceptual process to make sure that those things are factored in into into the entire plan i think that's really really important because the information is there and the research is there it just needs to be shared and at, at the critical point where where it's it's in the, the concept stages before it, you get too far down and you think buyback is an afterthought it's not an afterthought it needs to be factored in right from the start brilliant thank you um <laughs> i think i alluded to this question earlier on and i'm guessing it's an impossible one to answer but how much would biobanking a representative sample of the earth's fauna and flora cost to set up and how much would it cost to maintain I guess we're, we're talking about a lot of a lot of money. Um, I'm going to jump in here. I think there's a lot of examples, especially from NIH, um, the National Institute of Health, which has been doing biobanking for, say, um, mice and rats and things like that for many, many years. And actually, biobanking is far cheaper to maintain animals than it is in a zoo over time. And so as Christy mentioned, it's the setup of the, the, the institutions and obviously the personnel, but the actual maintenance is not that expensive over time. And I think, you know, um, like many other organizations, you know, I think a lot of wildlife uh, partners are starting to think about, well, you know, how can we do this and how can we do this, you know, relatively inexpensively. But I think it, it is not... A, what price would you, ha you have to bring a coral reef back? You know, what, what, what would you pay for a woolly mammoth? It's, they're spending billions of millions of dollars to bring a woolly mammoth back. So I think biobanking is the least expensive way you can, you can maintain species going into the future. Um, maintaining them zoos and aquarius is very, very expensive over time. And you can, it, they are just absolutely um, partners and, and amazing partners in, in working to maintain that, that genetic diversity. And so I think it's, it's, it's a really good cost um, and an effective man, way to maintain species. Yes, and I would just add, whatever the bottom line for doing that is, it is as nothing for the cost of humanity of not doing it. Yes. Uh, the, uh, while we have the chance, if we're not taking every opportunity, humanity is doing itself the gravest, gravest disservice. So you have to factor cost. Cost has to be seen in a very health related uh, sense for what 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 is to the human conditions um, ultimate advantage and everything we're talking about from a biodiversity perspective ultimately comes back to the well-being of humanity so this is all bound up to our collective good absolutely and and i i would just say from the kind of collections management perspective is that the more you buy and back the more you invest the more you look at these technologies um the more the cheaper they get the more they improve, the more their energy efficiency improves um, and the more sustainable they are. Mm. Um, and they are improving and they continue to improve. The technology continue to, to, to continues to get developed and it continues to be cheaper as well. So yeah. um, it's definitely something that's just continuous and with investment and that overall cost reduces. And, it, and like everybody said, it's just a no brainer really. <laughs> and, and I'll add one thing as well in terms of ecosystem services. I mean, coral reefs, I mean, they, they provide food for a good part of the world, and they also are involved in production of oxygen on our planet. You know, so, I mean, ecosystem services for some of our wild animals is huge on our planet. And if we are to, to damage them or to lose them entirely, it, it, it would have a grave impact on our survival on this planet. And I think, again, another quick reality check is that for perhaps the majority of species uh, that are in really facing a very uncertain future. Cryopreservation is probably the only hope they have. We can't pretend 
that that isn't the case. So there are no great resources of conservation assistance rushing into place for vast numbers of species. The ones that get that focus are the extremely rarefied lucky ones. That's how big the, the, the actual need is now. So cryopreservation has to be seen not just some, as some kind of peripheral spectrum thing. It's absolutely going to be fundamental to how much biodiversity makes it through this critical period. Yeah. Well, thinking about what is and isn't cryopreserved so far, I've got a question um, for, for Kirsty, but do feel free to, to chip in anyone, um, which is what taxonom taxonomic gaps are there in frozen collections? And are there any particular groups that are not currently represented? That's a very good question. Um, so from my experience in the collections, mammals tend to be quite well represented and well researched. Uh, vertebrates in general, actually, although the, the um, amphibians and reptiles less so. Um, but then if you're looking for a, a taxonomic group or a, a group of species that um, needs more investment and needs to be represented a lot more than you're looking at your marine organisms and your marine diversity and your invertebrates in particular. Thank you. So the others have got um, things to ship in with that question as well. Yeah, could I just make a, yeah. a distinction here as well? Because if we're talking about biobanks for phylogenetic and evolutionary biology, that's one thing. But if we're talking about biobanks that can be used for breeding, there's another dimension, which is how do you freeze and thaw the material without it? Um, becoming useless. So that's actually a big technological challenge. And I think um, that Mary has demonstrated really well how that has uh, helped in the process for the coral cryopreservation. Those sorts of facilities, um, I think, need to be turned to issues like um, the frog and amphibian project as well. Um, because those are technologies which really need to be looked into and supported. Uh, actually, they're not that much supported. But that, that is a dimension. You need people with particular skills. You need people who can recover um, those materials, use them to produce offspring. And the good thing about the amphibian as well as the coral is that they're both focused on population recovery rather than individual animal recovery, which is um, which has traditionally been used very much. So I, I hope that distinction is clear. In terms of whether there are gaps, then we are restricted in the use of um, animal breeding biobanks because there are particular technical challenges that need to be overcome. And so there's a lot of research that needs to be done. Thanks, Bill. Well, um, we've got a couple of minutes left. So um, there is a, a question here, which I think um, some of you have, have alluded to sort of some maybe skepticism about um, the role of, of cryopreservation um, and sort of ad adopting that as, as a fundamental part of, of conservation. And um, this, this viewer asks, you know, are there people that uh, think cryopreservation in, in conservation has gone a step too far? Or do you think that it probably is one of the only practical methods that may save biodiversity. Um, any comments on that question? Well, in terms of practical methodology, I think you know it's case by case, and I think the coral is an outstanding example, which is sort of much more advanced than really any other um, taxonomic group that I can think of. It's not a practical. Um, it's not a practical technique for everything. You know, if you want to breed some rare mammals, it's actually really difficult to decide, oh, cryopreservation is going to be the answer. Well, also, let's not forget that the nature of cryopreservation is also something in which you literally buy time for a species. And what may be impossible now may be very uh different in terms of practical options you may have in 20, 40, 50 years time, 100 years time, uh, even with relatively low level quality uh, preserving. You ideally want to have the best, the most optimal way of cell lines and everything else, but just the 
physical act of preserving that fragment or whatever it is, and let's raise the fin for the fish as well, which need to be taken into account. If you, uh, if you lose the coral reefs, you've lost all those species which rely on it. Better to preserve things as best you can. Things will advance in terms, let's hope, the actual technical abilities. But you're not going to have zero chance if you don't have that uh, actual representation there in the first place. Well, I think that's a really interesting point to, to, to finish on because it is going to be a case by um, case uh, thing to think about. But definitely it sounds as though cryopreservation is, is going to be a really important tool for us now and, and in the future when facing some of, of the threats uh, to biodiversity. Um, so thank you all so much for, for your contributions this evening, for your presentations and for answering all of those fantastic questions as well. Um, it's been wonderful to, to hear from you. So thank you very much for, for joining us. And thank you to all of you who have been viewing this evening. I'm going to share my screen with you one final time, uh, just to remind you of that survey monkey that I mentioned right at the start of the event. And um, please, we really would like to hear your feedback about tonight's event. So do go to www.surveymonkey.com forward slash r forward slash zsl event nine to let us know what you thought about tonight's event and perhaps what you'd like to see us covering in the future as well because this evening is the last of our current series of online events but we will be back in the autumn we're taking a break over the summer so please do let us know what you would like to see in the future by completing that survey and in the meantime do keep an eye on our uh, events page on our website because all of the details uh, of the autumn program will be going up there in the next few months and of course do subscribe to our YouTube channel as well because that way you will never miss an event. Uh, also in the meantime you can tune into our wild science podcast to get your uh, science fix and of course there are lots of other ways for you to get involved with our work at ZSL so do have a look at our website but for now Thank you again for joining us. We look forward to seeing you again soon. Goodbye.